Mayor Donahue, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, participate in this interview for the first female pilots in the Air Force. I'll, I'll hand it over to you to start. Okay, I just wanted to say something. I mean, your questions are, are wonderful. They're probably the same questions as an analyst I would do. However, they're gonna point me out as a negative Nelly. And um, I just wanted to say a few things about that. I did face severe discrimination in my entire career in the Air Force. Both I think from my competence and from being a female pilot and when I retired in 17 from a civilian in the Air Force, uh, old, age, old age, it was definitely there. Um, so I really, uh, I felt all the jobs I had, I loved. I loved doing them. I felt I did what I was supposed to. The job you're in now is the most important and to leave it better when, than when you found it. So I actually got my, um, not, all, not all bosses were bad, but I actually got my gratification, so to speak, from peers or, or things like that. When I worked in SyncPAC, sorry, it was called that at that time. When I worked in PACOM, um, General Moore, who was a Marine two-star, said to me uh, when I was up for Lieutenant Colonel, it was perfectly obvious I had suffered severe discrimination in my Air Force career. And coming from a Marine, when there were so few female Marines, I thought that was pretty good. And Admiral Larson, four-star at SyncPAC headquarters, he told me that, and you know, is it too late for me to extend you? I really want to keep you here because I didn't get to meet him until he had to keep canceling the program. I was working on the program, but meeting me. And I said, well, I'm leaving next week. So yes, sir, it is It is too late. General Field, when I worked at the Pentagon, when he retired, he said, it's very hard working at the Pentagon because you don't seem to think you're doing anything and nothing happens. But if you have left your Pentagon assignment and you have changed one airman's life, and that airman knows you're at the Pentagon, regardless of whether or not the airman knows you did anything for him or her, that is a successful tool. So just give you an example of that. I was called one night at seven o'clock Friday night and this guy didn't listen when I answered the phone and he goes, I have no idea where I'm calling. I just, I, I have a deployment. I don't know anything. I'm going out next week. I don't know what's gonna happen. What's happening? And I said, you call the Pentagon. He goes, oh, I got an operator. <laughs> So I said, no, you got the right person. So I helped him out. So it was sort of like that. I just wanted you to know. So it sounds like a lot of negativism. I did face severe discrimination, but I, I still did my job to my utmost in my opinion. So that's sort of what. What inspired you to join the Air Force? Oh, well. See, now we can take them out of order. Um, I, I don't really know. When I graduated from college, I mean, I'm, I'm the oldest of the class. I um, was number four in my school but I was number one in the School of Science. And the day I graduated, I was then immediately below every guy that existed. So um, I didn't know what to do with myself. And when I was in graduate school, I, I um, was friends with a lot of the Air Force, not ROTC, but the Air Force people, the officers they sent back to school. And I go, you know, why not? So, so I signed up. So that, yeah, a lot of depth in that. Yeah, that's, that's how I ended up in the Air Force. My, my dad was not in World War II because he was a fireman and they kept the firemen home and all his brothers were in the Navy. So it's kind of, we're not a military family. What did your family think about your choice to pursue the aviation career field? I'm a middle child. So I felt like I was um, severely independent because you know, the first ones are important. The bottom ones are, you know, they can do anything they want. I was kind of in the middle loss. I, I really didn't think they thought anything of it, you know? And, um, but when I went to graduate, you know, I was sort of surprised and that sounds funny, but my mom and my dad and my brother came to the graduation and my dad wanted a copy of all those you know, funky plaques we all bought them in a box somewhere. And now, you know, with the names on them and all that, he wanted a copy of everything and they were really pleased. So, you know, I, I underestimated them, I guess. That's great. What did it mean to you what, what did it mean to you to be part of the first undergraduate pilot training class to include women? To be quite frank, I didn't have time to think about it. We were much too busy and I'm a, a type A personality without, you know, some of the stuff. So I'm a perfectionist. So like I was always studying, I you know on media day, Kathy Lasauce and I just couldn't put up with all that stuff. So the two of us just sat under the tree and, um, surprisingly a lot of the reporters came over to us and that night it was funny because we were the ones that was on the tv and we everybody was like flaunting and so we thought it was really kind of funny because we said we had enough of this we we're just talking to ourselves sitting under a tree um i don't think of being first i mean i just uh i'm one of many um, a lot of pilots i'm not a female pilot i'm a pilot who happens to be female so i, I don't kind of look at that um 
And then I guess in the 70s were really the 70s. I mean, there's a lot of women's lib and everything there, but the issue was the guys really didn't like that. So um, everything, no matter what you know, women's lib, you know, so it's just kind of a different thing. So I really didn't put too much meaning in it. I was too busy in the program. How did you find out about the opportunity? Um, well, I could tell you a little snippet here first. I, I worked at Eglin and I was a president of CJOC and General Lane um, was kind of a strict boss and he was kind of upset because the guys, the guys, the, the, excuse me, the senior officers would always take down the guys. The hat was on wrong, the pants were too short, this, that, and the other thing. And he said, you know, women first started coming. We still had WAP squadrons. And he wanted us to put on a show to show the senior officers what a woman's uniform should look like. So we did a past, a present, and we did a future. So at the end of the show, Mary came down the aisle in a, in a light suit and a helmet. And it was really kind of amazing. And that was November of 75. And I've heard things that it was out by then, but it wasn't to wear it on our base. So I, I kind of found out of it because I, I had a friend with uh, Terry Gubreski and she she really wanted to do it, but she was five feet tall and couldn't do it. And I said, oh, you know, I don't know. And I was transferred right as they were doing it. I was transferred in June of 76 to the Air Force Academy. And then when I got there, she was hounding me again. I said, well, I won't get picked. You know, I'm not going to take anybody who has a hangnail, you know. So she kind of convinced me to apply. And they actually held the, the board open before that. And so then when I got selected, it was like, oh my goodness, now what do I do, you know? So it's like, I didn't have anybody who flew, didn't have anybody in the military, so I can't say I spent my full time. I did work as a missile simulation analyst and air-to-air -air analyst, so I was um, friends with a lot of pilots. I went to the bombing range and saw all kinds of things like that, so it wasn't, but it was just something that was, didn't have time to think about. It wasn't on my horizon, but good choice. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about having your story featured in the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force? Um, I think it's important, not necessarily that it's, it's we 10, but, but it's important to put that milestone down because it was very important at the time. And I think, you know, to have the accuracy is important. One of the things I found when you left Williams, I mean, anybody who was on Williams at that time was your instructor. And the stories that came out were phenomenal. And um, when I went to uh, SO, it must have been SOS, I was supposed to be writing a paper, and they said to me, Why didn't you look at this study? I mean, here's this study an ACSC student did on pilot, women in pilot training. And I go, Yeah, I'll read it, but it had to do with landing currency. And the goal back then, anyway, is that you only flew with three different instructors. You had your own instructor, but sometimes for different reasons you flew. You could only fly with three instructors. So he was saying that the women got better flying training because their ratio was 3.4 instructors, whereas the women's was 3.2. But what, even though that's probably not statistically significant, that difference, but his point of view was he didn't look at the fact the wing commander didn't count, the DO didn't count. The head of uh, whatever didn't count. The squadron commander didn't count. The guys didn't fly with those people. Every woman flew with every single one of them. So it was a, uh, even though the math was computed correctly, it was an inaccurate determination of what happened. So there's all kinds of things like that. So if you can have something out there and it's factual, I'm not saying you're going to get into every little bit, but if, and it's factual, then people can go go back to what it is. My, when I was in Stanaval, my navigator said, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I go to the club every weekend and I have to defend you and I'm tired. Of it. I'm just not going to do it anymore. You know, these people have never flown with you. They don't know how well you fly. And they're always making these comments. And I've had it, you know, <laughs> he was seen as a funny guy. But so that's kind of what it is. So it's good to have a something that shows puts a line in the sand, so to speak. So thank you for doing it. Oh, of course, it's my pleasure. What, uh, when museum visitors see your exhibit, what do you hope they'll learn from your experience? Probably not what they would, but I'd like them to see they were just 10 gals who graduated under the same standards uh, with the guys. There were 39 guys in our class, the 10 were in there. They kept saying we were taking guys' positions and the 10, that was the biggest class. They put the 10 over and above the normal class size and our class size. Um, one of the things I, 
I'd sort of, I don't know how it would be in there, but one of, one of the issues was we were, that test case, every day, every single grade report had to go to the Pentagon, not exactly the big place, I don't know where it went. But the pressure that put on the IPs, they would say, I mean, they just fill out a grade sheet, check, check, this, this. They had to do them three, four, five, six, seven times because they were gonna be presented daily at the Pentagon. So it put a tremendous pressure on the instructors that we had. And so they were really part of that training class. It gave them a, a, over and above what needed to be done. So um, there's just a lot of aspects, I guess, to, to the issue that it is. So I would just like them to see that not necessarily who the 10 were that, yeah, there was a beginning and look how far we've come. Before undergraduate pilot training open to women, had you thought about becoming a pilot? Uh, no, because I, I, as I said, I worked in the area with, because I worked in air to air munitions um, as a scientist, not as a munitions officer. And it wasn't an option, so I didn't think about it. And I remember sometimes I used to say, because one of my close friends was a fighter pilot, I don't understand that every cadet, the Air Force Academy, get flies on stuff. We're, we're doing munitions that require you to do 15 Gs for 30 minutes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we cannot get rides to kind of give us an honest, viewpoint of what it's like when you people have to use the weapons that we're making for you. So it was, and I wanted to fly, so it was sort of always a thing, but I never, since it wasn't something a woman did, I just never put it in my scope. But it, but even to get to fly, to say I could help me professionally to do my job better in designing munitions was important, but mm -hmm. I don't know where I was. You are an inspiration to many women who joined the Air Force and became pilots. What women inspired you to break barriers and be part of the first class of undergraduate pilot training to include women? This was the 70s. There were no female role models. They didn't exist. Um, I didn't bump into women in the jobs I had. I was one of many in a 300 officer lab. I'd be the only woman. Um, but I the person that probably did, did the most for me was actually a male, Colonel Bill Lynch. When I, I worked for him, I moved from the Air Force Armament Laboratory over to the Test Development Center. And he called me in and he goes, Mary, I'm Bill. As sci I was a second lieutenant, he's a colonel. As scientists, we're equals. You need to provide me your knowledge, whatever you have. He said, once you do that, then I'm Colonel Lynch. It's my job to determine whether or not you I'm going to listen to what you say or just say, okay, she said it, but that's whatever. He said, but if I fall on my sword and I find out that you had the knowledge that would have stopped me from falling on my sword, you're a dead person. Now, I got that as a second lieutenant, and I carried that all the way through the Air Force. The Air Force gave me, I had training before I came in. The Air Force gave me a lot of training. I need to do my best. It's my responsibility to give you my knowledge. Problem is, a lot of people don't want to hear that, but it didn't change how I was. So that's sort of the role model, so to speak, of how I was. Also, Norma Brown, but I think I met um, General Brown after I was a pilot, so not before, but at the, it was at the academy, but I was only there 54 days the first time. So I'm thinking it was after I was a pilot and she, I was talking to her and she was in, she was a two star and, you know, I'd asked, uh, somehow it came up whether, you know, what she was looking forward to. She goes, well, I'll stay in as long as they treat me with respect. But if the, the next job they give me is something that is a typical female job, I'm out. So she got out. So to have you know someone like that, even way back then, know that you know I can do the same as you can do, give me the opportunity. But that was, I believe, after I was a pilot. But there weren't too many women around back then. Sadly, Susan Rogers passed away in 1992. How would you describe her? I, I would describe Susan, she's quiet. She's very soft-spoken. She's a very nice, honest person. She was the genuine article. She was in our section. We were broken into two, two sets of five. So we ate lunch with her, you know, just about every day. She was just a love. Um, and I represented everybody at her funeral simply because I happened to be here in the Pentagon when she died and went up to, uh, Delaware, but yeah, it was surprising, but she was just the nicest person. How long did you serve in the Air Force and what rank were you when you retired? 
Active duty, I was um, a little bit over 22 years, almost 23 years. I retired as a Lieutenant Colonel, actually served the Air Force for 41 years as a contractor and as a civilian. All of them required, I, I didn't get the jobs because I was a female pilot, but all the jobs I had required a pilot. I just happened to be the one that filled the job, so. What were some of your most memorable assignments or missions? Are there any significant events from your career you would like to share? Well, one of the missions that I am proudest of, so to speak, is I was leading, I was in the European Tanker Task Force. We didn't have bases in Europe at the time. And I was doing a mid-ocean rendezvous where you would take the fighters halfway across the Atlantic and someone would come and pick them up. I was leading a cell of 27 aircraft and six tankers and the rest were fighters. And one of the fighters, cause it's kind of tough for them just having a fly formation off a, off a wing for a long time, decided to just wander a little bit. We didn't pay attention and he wandered into severe weather. Um, he's out over the Atlantic. There are no abort bases, he's going down. And it just scared the heck out of me. I was a young captain, um, my first deployment as an aircraft commander. And so for 15 minutes, it was kind of scary. Everything was all, we don't have radars that are worth anything. So I spent like about, uh, you know, it felt like forever. It was probably only 15 minutes and the receiver was coming. The other tanker was coming in and my nav said, they want to talk to you now. I said, I'm busy. They said they're demanding it. And so they came up and said, this is Stanaval from Loring, Maine. You are in our altitude, get out of it. So I said, Stanaval from Loring, Maine. This is Captain Donahue from Seymour Johnson. I spell Delta Oscar, etc. And when you write me up, please make sure you quote the dash three when it says the tanker does not descend. He was the tanker to refueling altitude until the receiver, me, acknowledges level at the altitude. So get the hell out of my altitude, click. And then after that, finally, because if, if that, um, fighter had just moved one degree off and that amount of time, he would have been so far away from us. And when I was looking out, I said, oh my goodness, I saw him, he was like at my one o'clock. So I was able to bring him back in. I just, that, that to me was my, you know, to save that guy, that was probably one of my best missions. Um, the other mission I have, which nobody has ever talked about, but I was in another European tanker task force at a different base and, um, I went around because the landing, Seymour Johnson has tailwinds, it doesn't have crosswinds. And the crosswind was so severe that it didn't feel good when I touched down. And later the wind commander goes, that was a great land. I said, it didn't feel right. So I went around, so I'm flying and you crab into the wind, you know, so I'm not pointed down the runway because the plane is flying down the runway. And my co-pilot decided to put in full rudder deflection on me and the plane immediately rolled, like maybe seven to 10 feet off the ground and it scared the devil out of me. Um, the pod hit, did about $2,300 worth of damage, but I was able to salvage the plane and save the four people. I got a commendation from the European Tanker Task Force. It came into my box in the squadron with nothing attached. And even if you just you know, pick up a paper clip on the base, you got the wing commander, the wing commander, the DO, nobody, because they decided they knew the answer, but I knew deep down inside that I had saved four people. And uh, when I got to about 2,000 feet, I remember saying, and I don't know if it was over, thank you, Lord, I'll take the airplane now. It was scary. So those are my scary missions. My assignments, probably not supposed to say this, my best assignment was a non-flying assignment. I was uh, put in charge of the enhanced crisis management capability in the um, PACOM. It was bringing up an, an alternate command facility. I inherited from a colonel and um, he, he thought that just because he said stuff, people were just going to automatically do it. And they had scheduled the certification for two months from then and nothing was done. And I just took a board and there were three people. I trusted myself, my contractor and um, the guy who ran the uh, enlisted for me. I made a list of all these things. If these are yours, these are mine. Just find whoever is responsible and get them done. I know you don't know them. I don't either. We worked 60 days straight. And we passed our accreditation for an alternate command facility on the first go and SAC didn't. So um, that was probably my biggest accomplishment. I, I had sort of a command from a staff job, so I got no credit. We were deployed and we were gone, you know, for like 45 days. I really, and I didn't know anything, but it was basically communications and stuff. And I learned a lot from the enlisted guys who worked for me. I also, believe it or not, I liked working in the Pentagon. I liked the jobs I had. 
I was a division chief as a lieutenant colonel at two different divisions. Um, one was exercises during training, modeling and simulation before it became really big, the chief's briefing team, command and control, and then I was in charge of counter drugs. We were working on a modifying a, a drug airplane, and that's when I, the colonel cut me off at the knees. So I, I lost that job. And, um, but the guys at Big Safari, they actually told me like a year later when they finished with the plane that they really worked with the FAA and they got one of the tail numbers to be 6279 Delta. And I'm like, okay, fine. Mary, look at your phone, 6279 Delta. We got a plane labeled the Mary D. So even though, you know, I didn't get what I wanted from my, I got it from the people around me, my peers and things like that. So that was a good thing. Uh, why do you think it took so long for the Air Force to start training female pilots since the WASP had proven women's ability during World War II? Well, the WASP were dismissed. And I think that was a, they did a great job. I'm just saying, they weren't given any benefits, nothing and all that kind of stuff. So as far as they're concerned, they're done, just like Rosie the Riveter. We don't need you, don't need our jobs and all that kind of stuff. So they really weren't part of that. I think a lot of it is the male attitude and believe it or not, in the year 2000, there are still many males who have a poor attitude. They're not, they don't get rid of them when they find them. Even though the women are doing a lot better, don't get me wrong, but having worked at headquarters and retired at the end of 17, you still see it. Um, so, and they existed, that kind of discrimination existed. I was actually on the Air Force panel after tail hook. You're probably young for that, but that's the Navy's big thing and where they had all the big sex, sexual harassment thing out and um, with their pilots and the women and all that kind of stuff. So the Air Force put a group together. I was on that group and the general, male general, not wasn't in on it, but he was sort of overseeing us, came in because he expected us, you know, if they do X, you know, hit them 15 times with a wet noodle. If they do Y, do this. If they do Z, do that. And we said, no, we're not, that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to punish people for sexual harassment. We're here to tell you what the cause of the sexual harassment is. And as soon as you allow females into leadership positions. And we did have a female general on the board. She happened to be a nurse, but she was on the board. Until you allow females in positions of leadership, you are continuing to face this problem. He didn't like the answer, so he dismissed us. So, um, so I think it just took long and I think they were getting the pressure. I believe the Navy might've gone in a short time in front of us and the Army might've gone in a short time in front of that. So I think the pressure was there. There were a lot of because of the women's lib movement and all that kind of stuff, there was pressure in Congress from one side and then the other side saying, you know, we shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that stuff. So it sort of happened. And as far as I know, it happened very quickly. Did you think pilot training was more difficult because of your gender? No, um, some of the tests that they gave us were, were hard in the sense that, um, I don't know what it had to do with anything. My dad was a fireman, but he, we do a lot of carpentry work and, uh, and plumber. We had been a plumber's apprentice. So you could do kind of plumbing work. And I remember one of the tests, it was just identifying all these, not hammers and chisels. I mean, some of those are easy, but some of these things were like, and I said to people afterwards, you know, I was in the backyard with my dad many a time when he worked with this machine that put the threads on a pipe, you know, so you could screw it in. And that was what was asked for in that problem. I know, I knew that, and it wasn't the answer, you know? So the tests they gave us were male related tests that had absolutely nothing to do with being a pilot, except the nav test. And I had fun doing the nav navigation exam they had, but, but that was you know, outside of that kind of stuff. Um, I think it might've been harder on the IPs because they, they didn't know how to work with a woman. Um, I know on my first flight, I had a faulty G suit and I just finally screamed and my IP goes, what's the mess? It's really, and it's killing me. He goes, well, unplug it. He goes, man, I, imagine going down, having killed the first pilot, female pilot in training, you know, so they had so much pressure on them and they don't realize that we were vocal. One day in the T-38, we were going through a cumulus crowd and it was cloud and it was very, you know, real dense. And I just said to him, I said, you know, that looks like a brick wall. We're going to glide right through it like butter, you know? Shows aversion to clouds because they had to make comments on everything. So, I mean, now I had aversions to clouds, whereas I was just making a comment, you know, because women tend to talk more than males do. So I think it affected the guys more than it, than it did us. Um, but I don't think it was more difficult at all. 
Uh, do you feel that the instructors were harder on the female UPT students? It, that's really hard to answer. I think for the most part, they were fair, but there were some that were adamantly and overtly against having women. And when you flew with one of them, and he, one of the ones I flew with was a fighter pilot, and I he was there then, but he had come from being a fighter pilot. He didn't want to be there. He didn't want to be teaching women. And it was a formation ride. And he, you know, his idea of doing stuff was two ways to do um, <clears throat> close formation. When you're going over the top, one is to trail and one is to go up beside. But if you trail, I can't see. He likes to do trail. So like the whole ride, he's doing trail. I can't see a damn thing, you know. And um, he was, I think he and some of the others that were that vocal, I think it affected their fairness. I think they were biased. But Thank heaven you didn't have to fly with them. None of my instructors were like that, but once in a while we had to fly with somebody. I don't think they perhaps were not as fair as they should have been because they were overtly biased. Did you ever feel standards or requirements were modified to help women pass UPT? Uh, standards and requirements might've been modified, but it certainly wasn't to pass. There was never a height restriction until we came in. So you had to pass a five, Four, I think, or something like that, um, which is why my friend Terry didn't get in. But I'll tell you, they, and then once we get to 30, well, it's okay you do 37s, but you know, ah, no, no, we don't think you should be doing 38s. So they brought a team in to do a test on T38s, and they took the 10 women, and the design criteria of the T38 is that you can see the red rings. There's red rings on the pedal tube that comes out of the front of the T38. And so the design criteria is the right height to be flying that plane as you should see the rings. So they tested all of us. I don't know if they're gonna chop us at that time. I'm not really sure. Nobody saw the rings. So I just said to them, being a scientist, I said, do you mind if we check one more? Oh no, go ahead. So I went and got Hugh Prendergast, who was the tallest guy in our class. He was six feet. He needed a, um, he was too tall for the T-38. He needed a waiver because his head, head would go through the canopy before the canopy piercing tool. So he got in. He saw no red circle. So that immediately, you know, de debunked that test on them. Because there's always, you know, one more thing. We, you know, maybe you could do this, but not this, you know. So, and I think Carol Shearer made kind of a, a comment about that later. So that was one of the things that I, I don't know if I stopped it, but I think they kind of realized, oh, it's kind of not a way to go about it. Um, you won an award during UPT. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, I won the academic award. And um, it's going to sound kind of funny. I, I got just one question wrong, but the question was actually a bad question. I'm a teacher. I've done a lot of teaching. I went up to the guy and I said, you know, there's um, there's no punctuation in here. Depending upon where you put the comma in this sentence, the answer is either this because of X, Y, or Z, or it's that because of X, Y, or Z. I'm not going to tell you the answer. He said, no, I'm just asking you to tell me the question. So then it gets down to what I call the 50-50-90 rule. If you have a 50% chance of getting the right answer, 90% of the time you're gonna pick the wrong one. So I picked the wrong one, so I got that wrong. So I, um, yeah, I, I mean, I would just work very hard and I have, uh, I, I've always done pretty well in school. So I, I worked hard to, to get it done. So I got the academic award. I, all the, many of the women had told me that you had won this award and that it had only been one question. And I thought, well, that's incredible. That's really great. And it was only until I think last week or the week before that I realized there were 360 questions on this test. No, there, there were tons of tests. There were lots of different tests. So I think all together, the test, every block you went through, like aerodynamics one, aerodynamics two, they all had their own tests. So I think that was like, um, I don't remember a real big test except when we took the, uh, commercial test for a commercial license, but yeah. Oh, that's impressive still. Why were the female students required to attend pilot screening prior to starting the class with their male peers? I have no idea, but I can personally tell you it was a very bad idea. There were only three people in that class who did not have private pilot's licenses. One was me, um, one was a guy, and he did what he was not supposed to do is on the weekends, he went and he paid to get instructions. I, Mary Livingston was my seatmate when we started. She had a private pilot's license. And um, we flew with this woman, young woman, she was probably my age, but she was bitter because it was past, she had to be a little bit older, past the time for her to be in. 
and I, I would ask her questions when we flew, because of course Mary was up, does all the stuff. She's got a private pilot's license, you know. And I say, well, you know, you need to show me how to do this. You need, you need to teach me. I'm not a teacher, I'm an evaluator. So I said to her, well, how can you evaluate something I don't even know if you're not willing to tell me? So it was really bad. Finally, everybody left. Now, Kathy Rambo may have told you this, but I, I ended up staying there because I did not finish. I had a solo, get to check ride and solo. And uh, my landings weren't where they should have been because I said I didn't get any training. I was being evaluated. So um, when they left, uh, Mr. Drine and this lovely man, you know, taught me how to land the airplane. And then I, on that day, I went up with a, a major for my check ride and my solo. And he said, you know, you really deserve to go to pilot training. I didn't want to tell you the winds were out of limits and I let you fly anyway. I wanted you to do it. So here, here was someone who believed in me. So I was kind of the last, I showed up before the, I needed to be there, but I was like one of the last ones that showed up on uh, whatever. And we started on my birthday. So I thought that was a good omen. So no, they shouldn't have gone. The flight screening, it affected the rest, the ones of us that needed the, right. the training. Do you think the acceptance of female aviators during the 1970s was symbolic of the changes in America? I'll fault you on your word acceptance. We weren't accepted. We were um, made female aviators then, but it wasn't accepted. Um, the 70s were the 70s. That, you know, again, the, the women's live, all this kind of stuff. It really rubbed guys the wrong way. So we were like in their face. We're taking their jobs. We're doing this. We're doing that. Even, the, as I said, that I, I consider the male cadets to be in their fifth year of the academy. That's what they acted. You know, we just came directly from there. And yet some of us were captains and they, um, you know, it didn't matter. They were the king. And, and to show you how uh, one of the guys there, Ernie Woolard was in our section. He said to me, he, us, one day he sat down and goes, you know, I don't believe you should be here. None of us do, he says, but you're here and we're gonna make the most of it. Ernie would study with us. We um, helped him on his dream sheet. You know, he was all over the place. So he would get the plane he wanted. And to tell you how it went over that year, we were, you know, working on getting, you know, graduation party when we finished, nobody was interested. And then we discovered the males had a graduation party to which none of the 10 were invited. So I think that just capped off the, uh, the year kind of strangely, but that's what sort of happened there. So I don't think we were really accepted. Um, there were changes in America. So probably, as I said before, that's probably why they put women in because they knew the pressure was going to come down to do that. What aircraft did you fly during your career? Oh, let me, one more thing about acceptance. I didn't bring this up. I was going to SAC. SAC, I don't think really wanted women. Um, my aircraft commander I ended up getting told me that all of the guys would go into the squadron commander and say they didn't want me on their crew. So the squadron commander said, the next person who walks into my office and says, we don't want Mary on the crew, my crew is going to get her. So my um, my aircraft commander talked it over with the crew and they went in and said they would volunteer to take me. And that was the best crew I ever worked with. They were wonderful people. We're still friends to this day. Meant to mention that. Okay, what did I fly? I've flown a glider. Um, I've flown T-37, T-38, both in um, pilot training and also in ACE, the Accelerated Crew Pilot Enrichment Program. So I have a lot of hours in both of those. I flew the T-41, um, KC-135, EC-135, and I uh, have several sorties on the B-52. Uh, one of the funniest ones I have, I was sitting down, Seymour, we were up and down and the tanker squadron was downstairs. It was Friday afternoon and the squadron commander from the B-52 came down and said, Mary, hey, you want to fly in a B-52? I said, oh, sure. It was me and him and the evaluator was this check ride. And a B-52 is a very strange animal. When it lifts up, the nose is pointed at the ground, you know, so he'd be saying, Raise the gear. But I'm not raising the gear. I'm putting here's this check ride, you know. So, but I was in the left seat. So we had kind of fun on that particular one. He did pass, but it, it was really fun. And then I went on a really long mission over the water and saw some of the water intercepts, which was which, which one of the guys they call Mr. B-52 because he could really make that plane hum. And it was a fantastic mission. So I have a couple of missions on that. So that's it. If women had not been limited to flight instructors and transport and tanker pilots, which aircraft do you think you would have chosen? I, I think I would have chosen an F-15. I think they, they were coming out about that time simply because I worked in air-to-air -air munitions 
And I think that would have been a continuation of what I was working on. But I didn't have a problem with the tanker. I like didn't like alert. I liked the tanker mission because I, of all the planes, we were part of the action and that we would go in, you know, as far as you could and, and the, the fighters would have to come up with whoever, whoever it was to get fuel. So it was, I felt it was part of the operational mission versus just trash alone. So, um, but alert was not fun. Did you ever regret not being able to fly a fighter aircraft? Um, not really. This is something I forgot this thing. I chose the 135 and my friend from Eglin who had worked with me was up at TAC headquarters. And she said, make sure in your 135, you get a base that has a T-38 ace because they made the decision, this is now 77, that they're going to put females in fighters next year. Now, when did that happen? 92? Anyways, that's kind of funny. Um, no, I really didn't regret not having flown. Um, I, I really enjoyed flying the tanker, regardless of the auspices under I did it. Because when I said, once you lift off the ground, you know, forget about those people. They're not there. You're just doing your mission and having fun. So, um, and I also, one of the guys in a class ahead of me, at, he was, uh, you know, from Sweden or one of those countries, he told me that a lot of the guys that had gone to group because they really pushed on that the guys should be fighter pilots. He said, they really don't like hurtling their body at the ground. And there's no mission to show them that that's what it's like. So I probably would have, would have been one of those, although I wanted to do it year to year, I would have been one of those ones, but I didn't really. And you know, by the time it happened in 92 and General Hermannberg asked me, did somebody put her up? Did somebody put her up to ask for that plane? I said, no, sir, that's something she really wanted, you know? And I, I forgot her name, but the one that got the, the first plane, I, as I said, it was 91 or 92. So yeah, mm -hmm. it was kind of kind of fun, but that's basically, I, I liked the plane I flew. I liked the mission. I just hated the environment I had to work in. Was your status as one of the first Air Force female pilots well known throughout your career? Do you think it impacted your career or experience with the Air Force? I think, um, I, I think it was aware. I didn't think it gave you any edge. It didn't really get me any special jobs or anything. It, my first crew would go, oh yeah, great. You know, I used to call them, I made everybody little t-shirts and called Dan Drew aircraft commander on Mary's crew because we were constantly called on to do static displays because they wanted to put me out front. But I met some interesting people like the head of the department of defense in Germany and he sent me a nice letter afterwards and everything. So I, I got to meet a lot of people that way, but we were like static display a lot um, because of things like that. So, you know, I got to meet a lot of people that way, but um, I don't think it was really any opportunities because any of the jobs I got that required me to be a pilot, any uh, guys could have done those jobs also. So I don't think it really did anything. I think I got more when I was a civilian, you know, and all these generals, people say, just look at the picture, you know, in Florida 10 where the women's card was, you gotta go see the picture of Mary. You know, I was like, okay. Oh, they keep coming in and saying that. I said, yeah, it's down there. And oh, by the way, it's a horrible picture you guys have on the, uh, that you're using. Um, the reason I don't like that picture is it's not a straight on picture, which it makes you think it is. It's a, you know, an angle. So Connie Angle is taller than me by two inches or so. And yet if you look, I'm the one on the far right. I mean, I'm this Amazon, you know, and everybody else, I'm about the size, except a little bit more weight than Susan Rogers, who's on the other end, but it's actually at, taken at an angle. So I don't like that picture. My vanity does not like that, that picture. <laughs> anyway. Did becoming one- tried, Oh, no, you didn't ask me that. Go ahead. And did becoming one of the first Air Force female pilots open other opportunities in your career? No. As I said, I just got jobs that required, and then they could, you know, kind of MPC or whoever they are now, uh, AFPC could kind of hit two birds with one stone. Hey, we need a pilot. We need female in the joint job. Boy, we get two two things with one notch. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, except, you know, I, when I flew at the academy, I usually can only fly two years when you teach. But I said, I'm going to lose. I need to get my um, gates met. So I need to fly all four years. So I did when I was at the academy. I flew all four years as well as teaching now. How do you think your success impacted other women? Um, 
I'm not sure they think so much about the first class, but what it did was open up the opportunities. And I went to the Women's International Conference in Nashville, well, it might be four years ago now, I'm not sure. And I think the thing that amazed me, I mean, I was amazed the entire weekend I was there is how far the women have come, how much respect they're given. Um, all these companies came out. It wasn't just that, the women, also the maintenance officers, they had scholarships for them. They had everything, all the mentors. And I'm sitting there going, you got to be kidding me because it had come so long because I, I only flew up until 88. So from 88 on, I was in staff jobs. And um, I was amazed at how far. So I don't think they think back and said, hey, there's these 10 that made it happen. But because we were there and because we did that and because we were so successful, because all 10 graduated in second class, only six of the 10 graduated. Um, I mean, that's that opened up the door for their opportunity. And I think that's makes me feel good about that. Did you ever feel judged by the wives of fellow pilots? Yeah, I think that's what caused the problem when I went to Seymour because they told me wives flat told their husbands if she is on your crew, I'm divorcing you. I mean, the assumption is made that, you know, you're this whatever. And I, I was a flight commander. This, was, this might have been Grissom, but I was a flight commander and it was our turn to put on the big ring party and we made a um, uh, fall type thing. And, and it's funny because all the guys, will fly with anybody else's wife. But you don't dance with anybody because you're single, you know? I mean, it's like, what's the difference? I mean, so it's kind of one of these things, but they were really afraid of what the wives would do. Now, some of the wives I became extremely close friends with, um, and we were friends all the way through, so we would do things together, the three of us, you know, two girls and her husband, you know? Um, but yeah, there was a lot of, just as you saw in the Navy about the submarines and stuff like that. And they were really like concerned about alert, but alert was really no big deal. I did get a single room, but there was one double because the single rooms only went to the aircraft commander. So my aircraft commander had to go with my nav, but there was there was only one double room, all of them were three. So because of that, every time we were on, they at least got the double room and they were good buddies working together. And, you know, we would work things out. Like the guy said, you know, you, you kind of have an entire bathroom to yourself. I said, I said, I don't have an issue. I'm telling you, this is the time I'm going to take my shower and you're welcome to that anytime. So I opened up the bathroom so that they could, you know, do stuff. So we kind of, but you know, one of them sometimes said, I don't quite know why you don't want one of those dealy boppers, you know, those things sticking out the top. So when you sit and watch on TV, we know that you're in the room. So what we say, um, but the funniest time watching it is I wanted to watch a movie and we were watching football and, oh, no, no, we have to watch football. Well, the, the dining hall opened like at four o'clock. The football game was in sudden death. Okay. They all got up because they got to eat and I'm the only one watching football. So it was like kind of weird. And I, I, I razzed them like there was no tomorrow. But I said, there was sudden death, guys. I mean, the food is on for two hours, you know. That's all you do on alert. You do breakfast, you sit and talk for a while, they kick you out, they clean it, and you do lunch. So it's kind of a boring thing, but yeah. So yeah, you could have trouble with the wives, but there was some that were absolutely wonderful to us, so. Since you were involved in breaking the barrier for female Air Force pilots, did you break any other barriers during your career? Let's see, when I came into the Air Force in 73, as I said, we still had WAP squadrons, so we're kind of out there. I was the second woman to show up at AFATL, which had 300 male officers. She left as soon as I got there. She went into medical school. Um, let's see, I was the first female instructor in the math department at USAF, or I think two of us came in sort of at the same time, so it was one or two. I was the first T-41 IP. I was the first female ops reconnaissance officer at uh, SYNCPAC. I was also the first combined, they used to have an uh, operations op air operations officer and reconnaissance officer, and I was the first one they trained to do both of them. So that was not just because I was female. Um, I graduated number one in SOS out of 700, 693 guys. I realized guys, gals, I think I was the first female to do that. Um, I was chief of two divisions, Colonel Job at the uh, headquarters of the Air Force, General Lawson, nominated me. I was an outstanding young woman of America in 1978, and I was the person selected for the state of North Carolina in 78. 
the first aircraft commander in SAC. Um, you know, just, I, I don't, you don't really, you know, you just kind of, someone said, oh, do you know? No, I'm just doing my job. You know, as I said, I'm not a female pilot. I'm a pilot who happens to be a female. So, and one of my friends that I helped to graduate school when I was, he was one of the fighter pilots at Eglin. When I graduated, I, I bumped into him and he goes, what do your wings look like? I said, well, you know, the radiator, you know? He goes, yeah, no, no, I got that. But does it have the mirror symbol in it or does it have, I said, no, I'm a pilot. It's got the, you know, he expected this separate category of female. And this was a good friend. I helped the graduate school on there. Something's missing here. So yeah, kind of strange. <laughs> what message would you give to young women considering a career in the Air Force? Um, I would tell them today, the sky's the limit. There are challenging jobs, uh, varied experiences. Go for it, but you really have to keep your eyes open. As I said before, even in 17 when I left, there are still some males there that have this really bad attitude and they don't seem to do anything about them when they find them, you know? So you kind of have to, you know, do a good job regardless or around them or ignore them, so to speak, at that and just work, work on your own stuff. But I, I had so many challenges I never would have had. As I said, a journalist, I've done so many different things. It was, you know, and, Sync pack. I worked since the alternate command facility could do a lot of really good comms. When soft pack went out on operational missions, we set up. I would have my guys set up calm in one of the rooms that we could be with them downrange. And General Scott, that was the first time that happened. It was no Mary. Next time we go out on an operational mission, you're coming forward with us. I thought that was kind of nice because there were no females in soft, you know, uh, special operations command. But they didn't go out again on an operational mission before I left. But I thought that was kind of nice. So I. I got a lot of experience with electronic warfare. Um, they did counter IED, was done by electronic warfare officers, even though they knew nothing about us. We had a setup, I was on the joint team that set up the training, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we did that. The Air Force ran um, counter IED in uh, Afghanistan. So um, I really learned a lot of, I have a hodgepodge of everything in the Air Force. And I think that was really a good experience for me. You mentioned earlier that you were at the academy in 76? Yes. Um, so did that was the first class with women. Did you have any interaction with women who were enrolled? Yes, I mean, I taught some of them and I only was there through the first exam and how the academy gives exams in math is um, every cadet, so was, I think it was 1100 in that class, has um, the same exam and you have a grading team, the whole, everyone who teaches is grading and you teach, you teach 1100 papers, you're going to grade number one. Okay. And I'm kind of fastidious. And so I've been selected. I, that was a 54 day assignment for me when I was there in 76. So I left behind the guys and I had gone over all the stuff, Mary being Mary put right on the whiteboard. I hope you notice that three of the top five scores on this exam are women. <laughs> And I left. <laughs> so uh, yeah, they, I mean, they were in your classes. Um, I, when, when I got there before, I'm, I'm probably a better instructor for males only because I can tend to be sarcastic or stuff, which guys take a lot better. And a lot of it, it kind of offended the girls. I'm like, I didn't know what I had done to them or something, but you know, so, um, but yeah, they were, they were spread out in all the classes when I got there. So, and my friend Terry was actually one of the, um, they brought people, them in over the summer to kind of practice with lieutenants. So she was one of one. So she was there when I got there. She had them surrogate, I guess, what they called, surrogate first class to teach the upper class what they would have to do when they were there. So yes, I. Um, we've gone through all the questions, but do you have any other thoughts or ideas or stories you'd like to share? Um, one, one of the things I wanted to bring up because I saw you had quotes there. And I would say this to me is the best quote I've heard from that. When we were there, we got tired. Why this? Why that? Why the other thing? What are you doing here? Why, why, why? And Mary Livingston came out and said, why not? And I think that's the best quote that came out of UPT, and I use it all the time. Why not? Give us reasons why not. So anyway, I um I don't I don't I don't really know. I just said I just um I've done some wild stuff. I, I met um, Secretary, uh, no, I, 
Oh, I forgot his name already. Oh, oh well, Secretary Roche, because I worked on an operational mission at headquarters Air Force called Han Dowell. Um, and at the 10 year point, we had a reunion and he stood up and said, you know, I know you guys think this is the 10 year reunion. We're having a 10 year reunion of all these people that worked on that mission downrange. And he said, but you know what this 10 years is, is the statute of limitations is up. They can't arrest us. And I was sitting at the table with him only because one of the people who was supposed to be at the head table, his wife didn't show up and wanted to fill the seat. So even though there was only eight at the table, it was a huge table and it was across from me. So the next day they asked me to ride with his wife who couldn't walk. So we got back to lunch very early and I'm there, what am I gonna do about this whole room? And I said, I don't wanna look like a wallflower and sit at the end. So I picked the middle table, the middle seat on the long table. And all of a sudden this guy comes up and goes, do you mind if I have eat lunch with you? And it was Secretary Roach. And that was just so wonderful because we had this long discussion about, I worked AEF, which very unfair to a lot of the people that are deploying. And I was talking about, you know, some of the problems I had and all, we're just having this discussion back and forth. And he just said to me, where the hell were you when I was secretary of the Air Force? I said, I was there, but I was so far below you that <laughs> there's no way. So, um, cause he liked my thoughts and ideas. So I, um, I have a lot of good experiences, but the, the discrimination, and that's what, when my boss put me at the knees, I, um, two people had told me, I, I worked with General Hornberg, and he told me that two people from the Joint Staff 06s had come to tell him what a great job I was doing on joint exercises because the Air Force was like out in left field before I got there. So I got a PRF um, that had the words definitely promoted, in it, but it had... Uh, I was told by my boss who cut me off at the knees that he forgot to copy yours. And I was too stupid and my fault, too stupid to go up there and say, do you have a copy of this? But you couldn't put definitely promote and not be definitely promote. And that was a year be below the zone for Colonel. And then um, two people, one who was in headquarters, the Air Force personnel, and one is um, headquarters, you safe, who told me I'd make Colonel on that board. Um, do I believe that happened? Yes, I do. Um, that I got redlined, but I've never been able to do anything about it. You know, you can't get the stuff, you know where it is, they tell you where it is, you know, you go to the thing and say, you gotta look in their records, but you know, it, it's neither there, here nor there, but the fact that somebody could do that, and I found out later that this particular colonel, along with another colonel had a game, and this is someone that would know that, they had a game to see how many careers they could just run. Isn't that amazing? I mean, there's still a lot of people like that. So it hurt me very badly. So when I got out, I just wanted to do anything. So for four years, I went back to school and um, I was going to get a job and they really wanted me. But then when the, um, as a math teacher at a community college, but then when they offered me the money, I go, I'm sorry, I can't even afford my house payment in Washington on that. So then I went back and one of the guys I, I, I uh, taught with at American University, he said, you know, I can give you a job in the summer. I didn't know. He just died teachers with me. So I go and find out. He was the ops officer of, the, of, that, of, the op of this company. So second in the company, you know. And so I went in to interview and the person was interviewing me. This is just a part-time job. I don't understand why you know all the answers. I don't understand why you're doing this. I said, because that's exactly the job I left the Air Force doing four years ago. And when I got back to that desk, all my crap was still in it four years later. So... So a lot of funny things happen in life. I think that's about all I've had. You've probably heard enough about things that I can say. <laughs> oh, the other thing that amazes me is one of the problems they have, and I think any woman would have this problem even today, is I found that this person who chopped me off at the knees, when you have a competent woman working for you, it's not competition. You're the boss. All that person does is make you look better. So why? Or do they go out of their way to, I don't, that's something I've never understood. All someone working for you that's really good does is make you look better. So you shouldn't be jealous of them or whatever. I don't know what it was, but it was like one of those things like, huh. all, my, all of a sudden my career, my, se my second PRF um, that, he, that was written, which was the next year, I have to get out, it already happened, so I wouldn't get promoted. And it wasn't even any, and you may not know far enough, but it used to be, you'd have like fine. If you said fine, you were terrible. If you were good, you were terrible. Excellent was yeah, outstanding, exceptional, you know, all these levels. Well, he wrote a PRF for me that didn't have any adjectives for Colonel. So, I mean, he was really a, so, so that's a time when I, you know, finally, because I, by then I would have been what they call a road, a retired Lieutenant Colonel on active duty. And I would not do that. I'm too much of a go-getter to do that. 
So that's when I, I put in my, my retirement papers. But the last boss I had who hired me after that actually hired me as a, a, a contractor later. He was a great guy to work for. That's when I worked um, budget on the PDBE and I wrote the issue papers for the Air Force and used to brief the secretary in chief and get them ready for the stuff. That was also a really interesting job. As I said, I'm a generalist, not a specialist. I have all kinds of crap that I did, but I enjoyed all my job.